Welcome to Facebook Live's coverage of the 2012 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'm Marnie Levine, Vice President of Global Public Policy at Facebook, and joining me today is the 11th President of the World Bank Group, Bob Zelik. Welcome. Nice to be with you. Just a word about your bio, because you are a true public servant. You served as Deputy Secretary of State in the Bush administration following your service as U.S. Trade Representative. And in the George H.W. Uh, Bush administration, you served an impressive number of positions. This is only a couple of them. You served as Under Secretary of State for Economic and Agricultural Affairs and as White House Deputy Chief of Staff. Since becoming President of the World Bank, uh, Bob Zelik has been focused on issues ranging from poverty to post-conflict recovery. In addition, he's been a pioneer in leading the bank's rapidly growing, uh, growing its Facebook presence. This is very important. And the World Bank Facebook page now has 120,000 fans. It's excellent. Great. Thanks. We are delighted to have you here. So when did you get in? Uh, just this morning. Just this morning. So fresh off the plane. And how is it so far? Okay, I did, uh, my first event was on something that I feel pretty enthusiastic about, which is uh, women's empowerment and, uh, and the importance that gender equality is not only the fair and right thing to do, but smart economics. Right. So at a time that much of the world is worried about um, kind of sources of growth, yep. this is one that's untapped because yep. what our information shows is that you can get big productivity gains, that helps growth as well as treating people fairly. So that was the first event. That's great. So we had Nick Kristoff here yesterday who mm -hmm. agrees with what you're saying and um, also uh, mentioned some of the same themes. So uh, the World Economic Forum provides a time to examine the world's biggest challenges and opportunities. So I would ask you, other than what you just talked about, what are some of the key issues at, at the World Economic Forum this year? Well. Um, just from reading the papers before I came, there's a little bit of a pessimism, and I think this is, reflects the fact that, you know, it's been almost four years since the, the market crash, and I think what you're seeing is um, a certain weariness, anxiety, fear for a lot of people, large joblessness, I'm sure for a lot of uh, people on Facebook, or younger people uncertain about their future. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to do is look to some of the pathways to get out of the mess, uh, and so some things with the European Union, U.S., and recognizing developing countries have now represented about two-thirds of growth over the past five years. And so the world that I grew up in, where people talked about a first and third world, has radically changed. Third world's gone. It's now part of multiple poles of growth. Great. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems, and then we're going to move to the solutions. When you became president of the World Bank at the dawn of the U.S. financial crisis, um, you're now leading the bank through economic turmoil in Europe. And you've alluded to the need for many structural changes and the need to incorporate developing countries into the world economic landscape. How has the economic turmoil in the United States and Europe affected the bank's work? Well, the main thing is, is that uh, we needed to try to step up to support developing countries. And a lot of people may not be fully aware that before the financial crisis, you had a big crisis in food and fuel prices. So we actually put in some special facilities to help with social safety net programs with seeds and fertilizers for people on the agricultural side. Uh, once the financial crisis uh, kicked in, we're normally a long-term development lender, but we moved and we've committed over $200 billion of funds since the crisis started um, to try to help with everything from infrastructure to health and education programs. And we also have a private sector arm, IFC, and there we've tried to help things like trade finance and bank capitalization. So we range the world. You know, we're dealing with countries that are now the sources of growth, some of the, the BRIC countries you hear about, Brazil, India, China, um, but also some of the post-conflict states, the Liberias and the Hades. And so we have to customize for each, each client. Great. Okay. Um, the European financial crisis is, um, has been the central topic here. And um, I guess I would ask you, what's the one thing that the world can do now to avoid another global economic crisis? Yeah, good question and going to be a hot topic here. Um, I, I think um, so far what's happened in Europe is they've, they've muddled through with a series of packages as they approach a crisis, and it kind of gets them through the crisis but doesn't really resolve the problem. And when you ask about one thing, one of the tricks here is you really have three interconnected problems. You have sovereign debt, so the debt of the countries. The banking system, which is often weakened because it holds that debt, so if that debt value goes down, hurts the capital of the banks. 
but also for some countries, the competitiveness, their ability to, to export, because they all share a common currency and they may not be as productive in Greece as they are in Germany. So oh, at the end of last year, there were some good developments. Um, the European Central Bank has provided more financing liquidity for the banking system. Uh, they, uh, the, the Germans pushed this notion of a fiscal pact to deal with some of the financial discipline. And you have a new government in Italy that's really taking strong reforms. What I've been emphasizing this week is the politics of reform are going to be as important as the economics. Mm -hmm. And therefore, with a new government led by uh, Prime Minister Mario Monti in Italy, mm -hmm. the real challenge is because he, can he sustain that politically over the next six to nine months. And so the one thing, if you ask me one, would be to have Germany and others to offer some incentives and support mm -hmm. so that if they continue to follow through on these reforms, they can show to their public there's a benefit. Right. Politics, not just economics. Very okay. much. Um, in 2011, you put out a World Development Report entitled Citizen Security, Justice, and Jobs. And in it, you emphasize that countries must develop more legitimate, accountable, and capable national institutions that provide for citizen security, justice, and jobs, mm -hmm. which is a very mm -hmm. uh, hot topic here. How has this played out for developing economies and the global economy overall, and what does this mean for jobs? Well, for, for uh, the fragile states that this was focused on, what we were trying to do is recognize, you know, and many of uh, Facebook participants probably have seen this in countries, is that sometimes the security side seems disconnected from the governance side, seems disconnected from the economic side. So we're trying to see how those come together and get an upward spiral as opposed to a downward spiral. So, for example, in jobs, um, sometimes the economists say, well, look, we don't want to make work jobs because they're not sustainable. The security people say, we need jobs so that people don't pick up guns or, or, uh, mm -hmm. or move into gangs or other groups. So we've learned some lessons the hard way about how you can have various types of, uh, for example, food for work jobs or jobs that get some compensation. People can rebuild the country, but without interfering with the development of their private sector. Mm -hmm. More generally on jobs, you know, it really varies by country. So, you know, I'm sure that for a lot of younger people, this has been a tough time. Uh, it's just, I came out of college at a time of kind of a recession, and I know it wasn't so easy looking for jobs. And I think that now you're starting to see the U.S. come back a little bit more. Europe, it's going to vary. Germany is actually, in some ways, uh, unemployment rate's been going down, but other European countries have been struggling. Developing countries, again, we had some very good growth. Uh, but so I think more generally for jobs, it's a question of, getting the fundamentals of the economy right so that you can uh, deal with the issues of the debt and deficits, have a banking system, and support entrepreneurship. Yep. Okay. And that is a great uh, pivot to um, closing the skills gap. Um, we've talked about uh, many leaders, including our very own um, COO at mm -hmm. Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, has talked about the importance of closing the skills gap in making the U.S. more competitive in the global economy and has called on public and private sectors to work together to ensure that educational programs deliver these skills to students who you were just talking about. Similarly, many of the World Bank's uh, Facebook followers say that higher education does not teach the skills that they need for today's jobs. What's the World Bank doing to help the youth gain the 21st century skills that correspond to these market demands? Yeah, fundamental issue, and it may interest people that uh, we did a study on uh, with the Islamic Development Bank because this is a huge issue all across the Middle East where you had a youth bulge, and uh, developed an initiative called Education for Employment, mm -hmm. and it's a question about getting the feedback from the businesses to the schools about what skills are appropriate, mm -hmm. but also sometimes if people graduate with liberal arts or basic training, a uh, 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 basic education, how you might also have other training programs that are either put in by the private sector, put in by the companies, or in many parts of East Asia now this is a business mm -hmm. so that people will, will add skills on top of it. And uh, I think it's particularly important um, at a time of rapid change in an economy because the skill you hopefully you come out of school with some basic skill set but with technology changing and others you have to uh, keep keep current so I personally believe that sort of the best things you can learn are often on the job yep. and so if we can't get people into jobs can we get something through the training programs that at least connect people with what the jobs are likely to need right and I'm just going to do a shameless plug for Facebook right now because um, on Facebook we feel that we can connect people to 
to identify where these jobs are and also where resources are for training and, um, and skills development. And so it ties nicely to what it is to, that you're saying. Just to connect this to Europe, and we're talking about growth. You know, there are parts of Europe where actually people, there are short labor with some of the skills. There's other parts in the Mediterranean area where you've got some of those skilled people. You haven't had the labor exactly. mobility in Europe right. that you've had in the United States. If you're going to create a true single market in a fiscal union, you're going to need to encourage that mobility, and networks like yours can actually help people find those jobs. Exactly. Okay, so now, as this is Facebook Live, so we've sourced questions from, um, from our Facebook Live users, and um, at Facebook, we believe that greater transparency and openness is a way to fight corruption. And one on the World Bank Facebook page, fighting corruption seems to be a hot topic among your followers. And in fact, George from Peru asks, what progress has been made to lessen corruption around the world? Well, uh, the transparency, I think, is the core idea. We obviously have to do a lot as a fiduciary with our own spending and programs. And so there's audits and checks and other things. But what we found is most effective, and let me give you a story that drives it home, is that with an education program in one African country, they started with the simple idea of putting on the door of the school how many textbooks were supposed to be bought, how many teachers were supposed to show up, so the community could say, well, we were supposed to get 100 textbooks, we only got 50, there's supposed to be two teachers here, there's only one. If you then can connect this with a social accountability system, yeah. particularly with the types of technology that you and others are using, you can draw the citizens into an anti-corruption phase. So you combine not only transparency and openness about what you're doing, but you combine it with citizen empowerment. Yeah. So we've tried to do a lot through our own programs, but also to try to strengthen some of the social accountability networks in developing countries, and where we can try to fund some of this. That's fantastic. Social media brings um, individuals online and gives ordinary people a voice that they didn't have before. And the World Bank has been all about connecting the developed and the developing world, but through in, at an institutional level. How has social media changed what you're doing? Well, you know, it, it may end up being one of the most fundamental changes that started at the bank in my tenure, and that we opened something called an open data initiative. Mm -hmm. I used to go to conferences, and sometimes an older economist would come up and say, you've got some great data sources, but you still charge for them. And I would go back to our economic staff and say, why are we charging for this? And eventually I figured out it was some slight offset to their budget. So we've now opened up 7,000 data sets for free, they go back decades. And then we've now started to have competitions like Apps for Development Competition, where we draw in people from the developing world to say, how can you use these data sets? And it's part of this broader notion that you were alluding to about democratizing development. You know, this is no longer something that just happens in elite universities in developed countries. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we take the knowledge and learning that occurs in developing countries and also then share it with other developing countries? Mm -hmm. So by sharing the information, being trying to open up the institution, by broadening the network, frankly, you're going to learn a lot more practical experience from people on the ground in developing countries. And then if you link it to the social accountability side, you also catch the bad things that happen. Yes. That's fantastic. Um, one of the other themes that, that, which ties to what it is that you're saying here at, well, the theme actually at the forum this year relates to shaping new models and finding ways to improve the human condition, which is essentially mm -hmm. what you're talking about too. And you've said that a better world means that we must democratize development, mm -hmm. which is what you were just talking about. So I just thought maybe we could close here with what are the most important trends in international development and what new models do you think will emerge and will they be born here? Well, I think the most important trend is the power of ideas and experience from the developing countries themselves. So, for example, Mexico and then later Brazil started a social safety net program called Oportunidades in Mexico. In Brazil, it's called Bolsa Familia. For about a half of 1% of GDP, so if you compare that with U.S. or European entitlements, that's a pretty fiscally frugal program. They help maybe 10 to 15% of the poorest people get cash, but the conditions are you have to send your children to school, and they have to show up, and you have to get basic health checkups. We've now expanded that to some 40 other countries. For some poorer countries, maybe they may not be able to have that capacity, but we can build off the experience of school feeding programs, which also become nutrition platforms, educational community development. So the bigger idea, and it fits the whole Facebook logic of a network system, is, is that we, you know, the, the ex people have had a lot of development models, and we've tried to learn what works and what doesn't work. But 
any successful development has to start with ownership of the developing country. And if we can share more of the experiences across developing countries, then frankly, we can learn as an institution, but we can also help others advance. Right. Anything we didn't cover here today that you wanted to close with? We've covered a lot, so okay. thank you very well, much. Well, this has My been pleasure. incredibly inspiring. Thank you for coming here and talking about these issues in such a forthcoming way. Really oh, appreciate thanks for it. the interest of all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.